Today we're talking about a new addition to the blossoming industry of asteroid mining. That and other space news right now on Spacing Out. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Spacing Out. I'm Jason McClellan. Maureen is still away this week working on another project, but filling in for Maureen today is our friend Amy Shura Title. Amy, thank you so much for coming in the studio today. It's exciting to have you here. Well, thank you for inviting me. Many of you probably remember, Amy's been on the show before. We had her as a guest, and Amy is a space writer specializing in spaceflight history. Mm -hmm and you've written for a number of outlets, and yeah. who are you cur currently writing for? Uh, currently, Discovery News, Motherboard, America Space, Device, and my own blog, Vintage Space. I don't know how you keep track of all that. Yeah, me neither. That's awesome. <laughs> all right, well, let's talk about what's been in the news. The World Economic Forum recently identified the discovery of extraterrestrial life as an emerging concern. According to the forum's website, for over 40 years, the mission of the World Economic Forum, committed to improving the state of the world, has driven the design and development of the annual meeting program. The annual meeting remains the foremost creative force for engaging leaders in collaborative activities focused on shaping the global, regional, and industry agendas. For the Forum's Global Risk Report for 2013, the Forum collaborated with the journal Nature and identified five X factors, which they define as serious issues grounded in the latest scientific findings, but somewhat remote from what are generally seen as immediate concerns. These X factors are runaway climate change, significant cognitive enhancement, rogue deployment of geoengineering, cost of living longer, and the discovery of alien life. As The Voice of Russia reports, experts from the forum contend that, given the pace of space exploration, it is increasingly conceivable that we may discover the existence of alien life or other planets that could support human life. In 10 years' time, we may have evidence not only that Earth is not unique, but also that life exists elsewhere in the universe. The forum points out these X factors to encourage global leaders to reflect on what countries or companies should be doing to anticipate them. In other news, a proposed hypersonic suborbital space plane could take people from Europe to Australia in 90 minutes. This 50-passenger space liner is a concept by the German Aerospace Center. According to Space.com, the current concept includes a rocket booster stage for launch and a separate orbiter stage to carry passengers halfway around the world without ever making it to space. As Discovery News reports, project planners want to utilize proven rocket technology, which will enable space liner to fly sooner rather than later. Current plans call for the use of liquid oxygen and hydrogen rocket propellants so that the rocket engines leave only water vapor and hydrogen in the atmosphere. The company faces many challenges, though, including finding the right shape for the craft. Discovery News explains that, before moving forward, researchers first must finalize a design shape capable of surviving the intense heat created by gliding at hypersonic speeds through the upper atmosphere. The company hopes to attract funding in 10 years and projects full operations could begin in 2050. Back in April 2012, Planetary Resources announced its plan to mine asteroids for resources. Now, another private space company is entering the asteroid mining business. On Tuesday, January 22nd, Deep Space Industries announced its plan to launch a fleet of small spacecraft near-Earth asteroids for the purpose of mining resources. Wired.com explains that DSI's plan calls for the creation of a fleet of prospecting spacecraft called Fireflies that will travel to asteroids in Earth's vicinity on journeys of two to six months. These will be used to collect data about asteroids to determine the best asteroids for mining. The company hopes to launch the first Firefly in 2015. Space.com reports that the Firefly fleet will pave the way for a larger class of spacecraft called Dragonfly that will bring asteroid samples back to Earth during missions that last two to four years. Dragonfly mission should begin in 2016. And further in the future, DSI plans to use its microgravity foundry, a 3D printer using patent-pending technology that will reportedly be able to utilize mined asteroid resources to print metal components. According to Popular Science, DSI claims the microgravity foundry could potentially print new parts for Mars missions, components for new outposts that would replace communication satellites, 
and even space stations that can beam power back to Earth. DSI Chairman Rick Tumlinson recently explained that the company's mission is to find, harvest, and process the resources of space to help save our civilization and support the expansion of humanity beyond the Earth, and doing so in a step-by-step -step manner that leverages off our space legacy to create an amazing and hopeful future for humanity. The announcement by Deep Space Industries came on the same day that Planetary Resources unveiled a space telescope it plans to implement in upcoming deep space missions. As RedOrbit.com explains, Planetary Resources plans to launch this ARCID-100 telescope in 2014 with the hopes of aiding in the harvest of precious metals and water from near-Earth asteroids by 2020. Kepler, NASA's planet-hunting space telescope, suffered a setback a couple weeks ago after engineers noticed a problem with the orientation mechanism. Kepler was placed in safe mode for 10 days to allow its reaction wheels to lubricate, hopefully solving the issue. Although safe mode prevents Kepler from making new observations, the search for alien worlds got a boost last week when NASA opened Kepler's database to the public. Space.com explains that it would be difficult for Kepler scientists to get their jobs done without the help of amateur astronomers around the globe. And by making the exoplanet archive more accessible, it could mean that more planets are found and confirmed in shorter amounts of time than ever before. The NASA exoplanet archive is accessible now. And in case you're keeping track, Kepler has identified 2,740 planetary candidates and 105 planets have been confirmed. And Amy, this is something I would love to hear your thoughts on. It seems to be happening more and more where with science, kind of going the, the crowdsource route, taking this, these mountains of data coming in from these various tools and looking to amateurs to help get through all of that data. It's, it's pretty neat. I mean, they have tons of information out there. They're gathering tons of data, way more than they can pay people to really look through. So why not give it to the people who really want to know about it? Yeah, people it, love exoplanets. Let them find some. I think it's great. And just space in general. People love space. And, yeah. and fortunately, and I, I hope this is the case, I'm, I'm seeing it, but I think the interest in space is growing again. We're seeing more and more interest yeah. in space. So you've got a lot of people who are willing to donate their time. And this is a time-consuming process to go through. There's so much data. Yeah, so and I, it's I think painstaking it's data to look through, but... But my, my concern is, you know, how do they regulate the quality or, or knowledge of people going through this data, and mm. will it create additional work for people to then go back and have to verify what these people have categorized. That's not an angle I've actually thought about, but I imagine if somebody finds something they think is a planet, they then give it to the experts to verify it, but you're right, you could have some, some interestingly minded people coming in and just finding planets everywhere. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I hope it doesn't create more work, but it's great and it's good that there are people who are interested in donating their time because, like I said, there's so yeah. much data to get through, and Kepler alone you know, just finds... It's an awesome mission. Yeah, I yeah. love it. Well, let's talk about this Asteroid uh, gold rush that seems to be happening, the space gold yes. rush. Now we've got at least two companies planning to mine asteroids. What do you think about that? Um, interesting and very problematic. I mean, you're, you're talking about a body that's moving tens of thousands of miles an hour and hitting it with a smaller thing moving tens of thousands of miles an hour and coordinating those international efforts and figuring out who owns what from where and, and how to make it all work. I think it's, it's good in theory, but then there's also the question, of course, of is the mission, is the cost of the mission going to, you know, pay back on itself and what we get back? Right. That's yeah, I, you, you bring up a good point. I think the, the ownership issues are going to be interesting to see. And the funding, you know. I, I know that uh, Planetary Resources has a lot of big money people behind yes. that company. You know, And thank goodness for billionaires who like space <laughs> because that's really helping the private yeah. space industry and exploration in general. But, you know, something I have to point out with these, these asteroid mining companies, at least in their plans, is in addition to the resources they plan to extract and the money that could be made off of those, potentially, they have additional goals that would uh, assist in further space exploration. You know, both of these companies have plans to have sort of space gas stations yeah. where they could use the resources off these asteroids to have these space gas stations where other spacecraft could come refuel and go further into space. Yeah, which is an interesting idea. And logistically, it sounds like a nightmare. To where do you pick the asteroid to make the gas station in space? But so it, it'll be interesting, it'll be to, interesting see to see all of this unfold, <laughs> see if it happens. I, I, I think it's interesting. But yeah. Well, that is what is in the news for today.
Earlier today, I got a chance to sit down with Ben Hansen, star of Sci-Fi Channel's Fact or Fake, to talk with him about our upcoming UFO Congress and the Skywatch that he's going to be leading. So Ben, for a couple weeks now, Maureen and I have been telling our audience about, well, of course, the International UFO Congress and the fact that you're going to be there. Mm -hmm. But in addition to you speaking at the Congress, you're also going to be doing this really cool Skywatch. And I'd love for you to tell us a little more about what we can expect from that. Sure. Well, uh, just about, mm, I'd say, maybe five months or so ago, I was approached by Bushnell's line of night vision equipment. Their company is called Night Vision Optics. And so I had bought a scope from them. They came to me and said, hey, you know, you kind of cover a lot of the different uh, audiences that we cater to. Right. You know, the paranormal, I, I also kind of, you know, do the gun training and all that stuff. And so they said, would you like to work with us and be a spokesperson? I said, yeah, for sure. So I started selling their equipment. Um, they came to a couple of our sky watches. And what we're going to do is set up sort of uh, an interactive booth, okay, within the vendor hall. So our plan is to, to get kind of like a tent, black it out, bring several of our scopes for people to try out so they can go in there, uh, they'll be able to, to actually use them without you know, having the bright lights of the, the vendor hall. Right. And then uh, the night of the sky watch, we're going to get some uh, LCD screens and we're going to have just about every genre of, uh, of night vision equipment you can think of. We'll have thermal camera, um, we will have full spectrum cameras, we will you know, into the IR and UV, and we'll have generation three military grade, the, the top stuff of the, the night vision equipment. So that'll be there for everyone to try out. I hope to bring some scopes. Um, if people you know, wanna, wanna bring a little cash, research this before, I mean, they're not cheap. Uh, we, we plan on probably coming with about thirty to fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment. Holy cow! <laughs> so, in addition to you, they're going to be there with representatives, additional representatives too, right? Yes, um, we'll have at least one, possibly two, okay, uh, with Bushnell that will be there in the vendor hall. They'll be kind of in and out, and then later uh, they'll be at the Skywatch with me to help run things, uh, keep an eye on the equipment so that we can teach people how to use it. And uh, you know, hopefully we'll we'll catch something. I mean, I, the last time I did this, I recorded something uh, up in Utah that was pretty crazy, and I still don't know what it was. That's awesome. This sounds great. It sounds like a lot of fun toys to play with, expensive toys. So <laughs> it's going to be great to have people there, and, and for the educational aspect too, teaching people how to use this stuff and showing them the type of stuff that is out there. It is, you know, because when when I started doing this, and I, I would go to Skywatches, what what my question was, well, okay. You can maybe see something with binoculars or a telescope. If you have a night vision scope, uh, you might be able to catch something. But how do you then record it right. and share it with others? Right. And so what I'm trying to work with them is developing even better techniques. Um, right now, we do have camera adapters. So if you have a DSLR camera, you want to slap that onto your lens. Uh, you've got a Sony Handycam to film in HD. We've got all of these options so that when you, you buy the scope, you can actually take it and then come back with the evidence to share with others. That's awesome. Well, it sounds like a lot of fun. And to find out more, remember, go to UFO, ufocongress.com. has all the information. And the Skywatch is going to be on Friday, the night of Friday, March 1st. So you don't want to miss that. Thanks a lot, Ben. You're welcome. We'll see you there. Be sure to visit openminds.tv for all the latest news. We always look forward to your feedback. So make sure to leave your comments below the video on YouTube. And you can always email us at contact at openminds.tv. And I certainly want to thank my guest co-host, Amy Sheratitle, for filling in for Maureen today. Amy, thank you so much. And where can people go um, to read all of the wonderful things you write? amysheratitle.com is my website. My blog is up there, and links to pretty much everything I do is usually up there. So all right, fantastic. Cool. We'll make sure to put a link to that thank in you. the description of the video. And if you enjoy Spacing Out, make sure to subscribe to our channel. That way you'll be the first to know when we publish a new episode. But that's all for this episode of Spacing Out. Thanks for watching. I'm Amy Sheratitle. And I'm Jason McClellan. We will see you in the future.